Blessings and welcome to your program, Shalom, Shalom, with your host, Dr. Marisol Pelser, my beloved husband, Reverend Dexter Pelser. Amen. Blessings. Amen. What a blessing. And today's program is called, Why Do We De Need the Dunamis Power of God? Why do we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? And Brother Dexter is going to answer that for us. But before we start, I'm going to ask him to pray for the program and get it with the teaching. Amen. Amen. And Father, today we just want to thank you for all of your amazing yes. grace and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And today, Lord, we're speaking of the precious power of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We want to honor the Holy Spirit. And Lord, open up our eyes to see only your truth, our ears to hear only your truth, and our hearts to boldly go out within that truth and proclaim the gospel, Lord, to all the world in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, um, why do we need God's dunamis power? You know, the power of God. Why do we need it? Well, because the Lord says we need it. Um, and particularly to start out with when we proclaim the gospel. So I love how Jesus and the apostles make the dunamis power of God very clear to us in the word of God. So we're going to focus on that today. We're going to start out, of course, with Luke 24:49. I love this scripture because Jesus is um, teaching his disciples. And he says that we're, they're going to be witnesses of the gospel to all the nations. First of all, in verse 47. Then in 49, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So he's immediately telling them, he tells them they're going to proclaim the gospel to all the nations, but then he doesn't send them out, really important, right then to do it. He actually tells them, go to Jerusalem where you will receive the power to be able to then bring the gospel out to all the nations. He prepares them. He empowers yeah, them. That, exactly. So he's saying, you know what, you need the Holy Spirit in, in order to effectively proclaim the gospel. We're going to see why in a moment. So I love that. He, he sets things in order. As the kingdom of God proclaims things should be, he sets it as they should be, and how we'll be most blessed when we follow this. So, really right there, it's like, just boom. I need to be ambassador to Christ. I need to be a minister of reconciliation to bring people from their sinful state into the kingdom of God as sons and daughters of God, in order to be that ambassador of Christ and proclaim the gospel, I need to also be endued with power on high. It's just very clear. And we know that from the end of Mark where it talks about all who believe will have this power from on high. So we know this is the case. So now let's figure out what this actually means and why it's important. All right, Acts 1.8. So I love this. Of course, Luke wrote Luke. He finishes with this, almost as, this is almost the last scripture of Luke, and then he starts out right again in Acts, the book he also wrote, the longest book in the New Testament, and he tells us more explicitly what this means from Jesus' own words. He says, but you shall receive power, this is Jesus right before he's caught up, but you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So remember, he says, wait in Jerusalem until you receive, you were endued, filled with power on high. And now he says, you shall receive power, not maybe, but you shall, definitively, receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So here it is, again. Where's the power coming from? It's coming from the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit. So we know this, and we know this is necessary to proclaim the gospel. He never says, go out in your own strength and proclaim the gospel. No, he says, do it endued with power by the Holy Spirit. All right. So <clears throat> let's go to Romans 1.16. Because this really, there's a couple of scriptures that just really nail this down, the importance of it. And Paul speaks one of them right here in Romans 1.16. So we're really getting to the heart of the matter very quickly here. Paul says, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So, we're going to see here, the marrying of the word of God, which is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to pierce the division of my soul and spirit, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of my heart, able to bring me to repentance, able to convict me of my sin, the word of God, combined with, as it says in Ephesians 16 through 18, the sword, when we're talking about the armor of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which then pierces me. So I have the gospel, which is the word of God, which is the power of God unto salvation, now with the Holy Spirit. So let's see this second part, which is the Holy Spirit brought into this by Paul again. I love this. This makes it so simple to understand for me, which I usually need. 1 Corinthians 2, 4. And so I have no uncertainty that I need the Holy Spirit to do this. None whatsoever. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Really important that we understand this. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. It's really important that we know that the Spirit of God is the only way for someone to receive the spirit of repentance and to be activated. And I love the fact that, um, let me find the scripture. Okay, verse 4. Now I want to go back to verse 4. This is really the crux of what I wanted to get to. Paul says, my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith, your belief, your salvation, your faith, should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Wow. Here we are. The gospel, the power of God unto salvation. The sword of the spirit is the word of God, so that's the word of God, combined with the power of the Holy Spirit, which then demonstrates the kingdom of God through miracle signs and wonders to confirm the word as it is preached. And Paul said, listen, I didn't give you a good ethical lesson or a words of human wisdom. I actually spoke as inspired by the Holy Spirit the words of the gospel, but then, as if that wasn't enough, then that gospel was confirmed with the power of God being demonstrated through miracle signs and wonders. This is really what it takes to effectively proclaim the gospel. We're going to see this in Acts. That this was necessary for people to even come to true salvation. So, let's just reiterate this one more time, one more way, through the Great Commission at the end of Mark. We're just going to hammer this home. So there's no uncertainty in any of our minds that it's the gospel combined with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit which brings people to salvation. So go to the end of Mark, chapter 16. I love this. Starting in verse 15 through 20. And verse 20 will nail this home. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. See, the power of God is being released. you got to get this. The Spirit just fell on me. It's not only released through powers, miracle signs and wonders being done as the gospel is being preached by the person who's preaching the gospel, whether it be Paul or anyone else, or Peter. It's also by the people that are receiving the gospel having miracle signs and wonders reflected in them speaking of tongues, etc. Listen to this carefully. We can't miss this. Both sides, the power of God is going to be demonstrated. Listen. And these signs will follow those who believe. So these are the signs in those who are receiving the gospel. In my name, they will cast out demons, and the Spirit's excited. He's falling on me. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. 
And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So the people who are receiving the gospel, proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, are having the power of God fall on them as a sign right there. Even for their own faith to explode, to know that they're sons and daughters of God. They'll have that confirmed through the signs, miracles, and wonders, and the power of God being reflected through them. Now let's look at this. And I'm actually excited because I'm not sure I ever saw this before. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And then they went out and preached everywhere. Listen to this. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs, miracles, and wonders. Jesus is confirming it, both from the preacher's perspective and from those who are receiving and I love this. Jesus confirmed the word through the accompanying signs, miracles, and wonders. We're going to see this in Philip. We're going to see it in Stephen. We're going to see it. Even in Jesus, that as he preached, the word was confirmed with miracle signs, and wonders, both through the one who does the preaching and through the ones who receive it. I love this. Yes? It's when the gospel is proclaimed, is an action. And that action because it involves power, there's a reaction to that action. Amen? It's amazing. And the word doesn't come back void. No, it in, accomplishes that for which God we, intended yes. it. Yes. That's right. That's Isaiah. The word, the gospel when it's preached, believe me, it's the power of God unto salvation. When combined with the Holy Spirit and the demonstration of that power, both in the one who preaches and those who believe, whoa, this is where I believe true salvation comes out, true repentance, true faith is ignited. Listen, I want to talk about this in two perspectives, from Jesus, how this worked, and then from the believers. Okay, John 14.10. I'm actually really excited about this. Jesus said, do you believe that I am in the Father? And the Father in me, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Well, oh, come on. We know the works because the gospels speak of it. They talk about if all Jesus' works were actually written down in all the books that existed at that time, there wouldn't be enough books to write it down. That's how many miracle signs and wonders he did. And he specifically spoke of the works being the miracle signs and wonders. So listen to this. Jesus spoke the gospel in accordance with the Father's commands. And the Father, through, of course, the indwelling Holy Spirit, we know that from the gospels, performed the miracle signs and wonders. Okay? Now, let's get confirmation of that. I love this. Acts 10.38. One of my, again, one of my favorite scriptures to really show how this works. Again, I'm like a show-me guy. You know that. Acts 10.38. And God, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Wow, there it is. As J Jesus proclaimed the word, hmm. and that's the scripture before that, it talks about how Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God that the Lord confirmed that through the Holy Spirit and with power by doing miracle signs and wonders. You see, this isn't a, I hope this is real. No, this is the almighty power of God being demonstrated through his son and then through us as ambassadors of Christ for the very reason so that the gospel will not be done what Paul, what, I'm sorry, what John's, no, um, one of the, one of them said, it's not done with human power. No, it was Paul. Not with human wisdom, but through the power of God. That way, no man can boast, no man can take credit that I'm a great speaker, I'm very charismatic. Oh, oh believe, because I'm, I'm telling you the beauties of Jesus. No, this is not about me being a charismatic speaker. Everything is to be confirmed with miracle signs and wonders. Yes. We got to get plugged into the power source. And the power source is the Holy Spirit. Yes. Without him, we can do nothing. That's right. And those who are led by the Spirit are the sons and daughters of God. 
Romans 8, 16. 8, 14 through 16. Okay, Acts chapter 3. I love this. Follow this with me. This is really pretty amazing. And this is um, talking about Peter. Acts 3, 6. Look what, listen to what happens. We're going to follow this through to the fruit of salvation. So listen carefully to what's happening here. So Peter goes to a man lame, and he's releasing through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus did, a miracle here. Listen. Peter said to this lame man, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Not in my name, not by my power, not by my anointing. No, in the name of Jesus Christ. You want to release the anointing? All the glory, honor, and praise goes to Jesus. You want the credit yourself? Mm -mm. You notice here, Peter understands this. So, verse 7, And Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Look at the witness from this. This is how salvation happens. Remember this. The whole city is now gathering. Watch what God is doing through the miracle signs and wonders. Verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate, so they have a testimony immediately. This is true power of God being released. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Oh my, this is just so exciting. Now verse 11. <clears throat> now as a lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So now God is, through the miracle, called forth an audience of people to preach to. Look at this. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Glory be to God. No self-glory. That's the kingdom of God. Only the glory goes to he who paid the price, Jesus Christ. I love this. He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and was denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the Prince of Life. Listen to me. The truth brings forth true repentance. They're hearing the truth that the very people of Israel put to death Jesus Christ, their Mashiach, their Messiah. They're hearing this. Whom God raised then from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him, so it's not of ourselves, lest any man should boast, has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, verse 19, I love this. Now he hits the hammer. The word of God is a hammer. And it is a fire, and it releases the spirit of repentance. Listen to what it says in verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted. Not just confess your sins, but be converted. Reborn. And your sins, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may say in Jesus Christ who was preached to you before. I love this. Now look at the fruit. This is amazing. Look at Acts 4, verse 4. Hmm. So, you got to understand, Peter and John are being arrested, and in the middle of that, in verse 4, listen to what happened. However, so Peter and John are being arrested by the Sadducees, so they're being drugged off. Look at verse 4. However, many of those who heard the word believed. The same Peter who spoke on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 repented and believed. Listen to this. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Oh, my Lord. A miracle, a lame man walks, who's been lame, I think, since, since birth. That lame man walks, and all the people see the miracle and are marveled and astonished. They all come together at the temple. Peter 
proclaims the gospel by hitting them over the head that you're the ones who put Jesus Christ to death and he is the true Messiah. That's how this man is walking. Gave the glory to Jesus Christ who was raised from the dead. And then the true spirit of repentance was released because he proclaims the truth to them. And then 5,000 believe on top of the 3,000. Wow. They didn't compromise the gospel. They didn't make it... They didn't sugarcoat it. They didn't make it friendly for people. Yeah, so you don't have to repent. They actually, he actually hit them over the head with the truth so that they would repent. That's what I love about it. It says, by the truth will be set free. Not by the tickling of the ears and the lies. You're a good person. Just accept, confess Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. No, we need to repent of our sins before Almighty God, before the Holy God. Be truly in need of a Lord and Savior. Be truly in need for our sins to be washed clean before a holy God. Okay, so I love that. That's one of my favorite. So dunamis refers to not our strength, but, but not our talents, but the power of God flowing through us. That's right. Yeah, that's what dunamis power is. Mm -hmm. and, and again, Paul said it, it's not... By my human wisdom that I'm proclaiming the gospel, but it's being demonstrated with power. And that's exactly right. This is the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And so um, let's look at um, Acts 8. This is really important. I know this is a little bit of a diversion, but I want to make sure we understand this, that this power of God is not for sale. It's important that we understand this because it's not necessarily always followed in the church today or those who seek the anointing. Listen to this. When Simon, who used to be a magician, saw that through the laying on hands of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also, that anyone in whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, that this your wickedness, repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. It is important that we understand this, the, and that's why Paul spoke over and over, as did others. What, it, what we freely receive, we freely give. What we freely receive by the grace of God through what Jesus Christ accomplished for us, we freely give as living waters to others. It's not for sale. The gospel is not for sale, and neither is the power of God through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's not for sale. Pretty important that we remember this always. All right. So 1 Corinthians 12, we'll end with this. I love this. This is just so simple. But we always have to remember that the Holy Spirit decides how this power flows through us, how the gifts of God flow through us. He's the captain of the ship. Listen to this. Verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 12. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one, this could be any of us, is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. And here it is again. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing each one of you and I individually as He, the Holy Spirit, wills. The gifts of the Spirit are always to be done as led by the Spirit. That's why Romans 8, 14 through 16, and I love it, Romans 8, 13 and 14. 13 is talking about having sin, having no more dominion over there, you. And then verse 14 is, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So the Spirit is a captain. He is the power in us because he fills us. That's why we're to be filled with the Spirit. 
all the time. And he's the one who decides how this living water flows through us to others. And, he, and quite frankly, he's the one who leads us to proclaim the gospel. As you're walking down the street, as you're at Walmart, we've talked about this, at a gas station, whatever. If it's a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a word of encouragement, a prophecy, whatever it is that he wants to release. Remember, many of those things that are released can actually open the doors in that person because they see it, they recognize the power of God, and therefore, they're wide awake to hear the gospel and truly repent. For well, I love the power of God combined with the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. Those two combined are why salvation is real in people that receive it. So I want to just pray. Yes. Father, it says in Luke chapter 11, that we simply have to ask you, Father, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. That means we can actually recognize right now that we have not really waited to be endued with power on high. Perhaps we've just walked our own way in our best ability, Lord. Right now, we repent of that. And we ask, Father, for the evidence of the Holy Spirit filling us. We ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit in accordance with Luke chapter 11, Lord. We ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we surrender our lives for you, Holy Spirit, to lead and guide us all the days of our life in the name of Jesus Christ. We choose to honor the Holy Spirit as a temple of the Holy Spirit, that means, Lord, if there is any area of my life where holiness is not in me and yes. through me, I ask you to uncover that, shine your light on it, and bring me through repentance into the way everlasting free of the dominion of sin in any yes. area of my life. Because I choose to be a holy temple of the Holy Spirit. And I want to be a beautiful temple for you, Holy Spirit. And I want you now to just take over. So I ask for my eyes to be open and see what you want to show me. Even divine appointments, my ears to be open to hear your voice, Holy Spirit, and my heart to be open to receive in boldness and walk this out and be Praise doers God. of the word you proclaim to me, Holy Spirit, as you lead me in the name of Jesus. I surrender for this, Lord, and I ask that you will demonstrate this power as the gospel is proclaimed. I ask you to make divine appointments. I ask you to multiply the salvation that comes out of these divine appointments, Lord. And I surrender to be led by you now in a new, beautiful way, working with the power of the Holy Spirit and proclaiming your gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What a blessing. So remember, walk guided by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14. This has been your program. Shalom, shalom. We'll see you next week. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, shalomshalom.org. Blessings. Bye-bye.